to stand here. We're gonna go. Yeah. We're gonna stand and not okay. sit. Yeah. Hi everyone. We're gonna we're going to begin our Hong Kong panel now because it is we have a short amount of time and a lot of ground to cover. I'm Minky Ward. Alan Don. Alan, sit down, please. <laughs> I'm Vicki Warden. I'm an overseas press club governor. I'm also, uh, I've been at Human Rights Watch for 21 years. Before that, I lived and worked in Hong Kong. I'd like to ask the room for a show of hands. How many of you have lived or worked in Hong Kong? Wow. Okay, Martin, you box put your hand up. Uh, so, so I think that says the importance, certainly, of the for of the to press freedom and to the foreign correspondent community, to the legal community and to the academic community that we have represented here today. We've talked about dates being important in China, and obviously this is the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square crackdown. But dates are also important in Hong Kong. We're going to talk very quickly um, about those dates with three extraordinary, courageous Hong Kong citizens and civil society leaders. First is Lei chak -yun. He is a leader in the Hong Kong Free Trade Union movement. He has been a legislator in Hong Kong, and he is one of the leaders of the Hong Kong Alliance that every June 4 organizes the candlelight vigil in Victoria Park, which is the only place on Chinese soil that the massacre can be commemorated. We will go then to Ma Kin Tang, who has spent many years um, as a leader of the Hong Kong Journalists Association. She was a working journalist in 1989, and ever since then has been on the front line of press freedom, including doing annual studies of, the, of its di diminishment in Hong Kong. We'll go then to Martin Lee, the uh, longtime democracy leader, lawyer, barrister, and uh, defender of, uh, defender of uh, press freedom, the rule of law, and human rights in Hong Kong. So I'm going to start with, uh, with Lei Chak Yan. Um, uh, and I said before, dates were very important. We have, um, we're at the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Where were you? Can you tell us your story? Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm on T-shirt because I'm from the streets, you see. And um, yeah, when I started in the in the labor movement back in the 80s, and then come 89, and then you suddenly realize that your dream come true because your dream is have always in my dream have always been that if people come out to you know take their own fate into their hands, and I think that is what the the uh, the whole 89 democracy means for me. People coming out, all Chinese citizens come out to ask demand for democracy. And of course, when for Hong Kong people, I, I was suddenly waken up in a way that, oh, the people of Hong Kong are not no, no longer so-called economic animal. They really come out also, one million people coming out. And I remember uh, on one night, just one night of uh, concert, uh, by the by the um, artists at that time, uh, 12 million Hong Kong dollars was raised in one night. And so, and the problem now is, and suddenly you have uh, 12 million. And then uh, the Hong Kong Alliance had a meeting and say, who is going to go to Beijing to, put, to, to, to deliver all this money to, to the students? So I was the one that volunteered, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to go there. And, and then, uh, uh, I was there on the 30th of uh, May, uh, 1989, and of course uh, go through uh, the June 4th, and I would make it short, and then on June 5th, um, after the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre, uh, I, um, Martin arranged a plane to get all the activists and journalists uh, back to Hong Kong. And I was uh, going through the custom, and then when I go, went through the custom, it's a bit strange. Uh, they asked my name, the, the accurate uh, character of my name. And then I say, uh, my name is uh, this young. And then they let me go. And I think they, they, they get the wrong name from the hotel. <laughs> and so, but then they realize that, and then they go to up to the plane. And after going up to the plane, they check the, all the past, uh, the, the Wei Shang the, the, the permits. Uh, and then when they saw my name, I 
I, I was asked to go down, down the plane, go and get off. And the, the, the thing is, if you don't get off, the whole plane cannot fly. The, they would detain the whole game, uh, plane. So I have no choice. I, I, I have to be detained. And uh, that go through three days. And then uh, with the rescue of the, you know, the movement in Hong Kong, uh, I was uh, released after three days uh, with a self-confession letter. And so, and then I came, went, uh, go, went back to Hong Kong. And then, you know, and then I said that, you know, for this lifetime, I have to fight uh, the, for democracy uh, on, uh, with Hong Kong people and also with uh, all Chinese people. So, uh, Lei Shaoya, why uh, you have attended all of the candlelight vigils? Uh, why do I'm I'm always struck that Hong Kong people turn out um, ten thousand, hundreds of thousands in the rain. They bring their children. Um, they sit uh, for hours uh, in on the grass and sing. Why? What is the significance of this to Hong Kong? This is something that happened in China. Is is it a is it a symbol of hopes and aspirations? Yeah, I think uh, going back to actually, we have to go back to '89. It's a waking up for whole generation, my generation, that uh, the whole generation began to fight for democracy, and not just for Chinese people, also for people in Hong Kong. You know, we have the you remember the uh, return of sovereignty in '97. So we are all, then ourselves facing this regime that suppress the right that shoot, uh, kill their own people. So uh, I think it's very, for the people of Hong Kong, I think it's the same fight. Our fight is the same fight as uh, all Chinese fights because we have the same uh, re regime that suppresses us. And I think even now it's even more important uh, that we continue to fight. Uh, especially when we look at what happened in Hong Kong, uh, this qualification legislators, this qualification of candidates for uh, for standing for election, uh, political prisoner out of the Occupy Central, and now the extradition agreement. So you cannot escape uh, from uh, the Canadian vote said the cross of pandas. You cannot escape from that. And now the extradition agreement is about getting people from Hong Kong to extradite to China to be a trial, tried by Chinese judicial system, which is very, very, very uh, innovative in framing you up, uh, coming up charges against you. They are so in innovative that you will be shocked on how they do it. Uh, one of the things that did, of course, I was very angry on that, is that you are not even allowed to get a, a wine called a June 4th wine. Uh, June 4th memorial wine, and then you are jailed for three years just for making this wine. And this is a regime that we're fighting against. And this is a regime, this is a law, uh, you know, put out by the Hong, proposed by the Hong Kong government now, at this very moment, that you, you have to be trialed by this regime, you know, extradite you back to China for trial. And so the fight needs to go on. And I think it's very important for us to also re remember June 4th uh, because the whole legitimacy of the Communist Party regime uh, is their weakness. They are not legitimate because they kill their own people. So I think it's very important to continue uh, our June 4th uh, memorial, uh, our candlelight uh, vigil in uh, the Victoria Park. Thank you, Nga. Um, now we go to Ma Yin Tang, who, as I said before, is uh, both a working journalist, she's a correspondent in Hong Kong, but she, uh, for Radio France International, but she's also been one of the leaders of the Hong Kong Journalists Association, which is the preeminent press freedom voice in Hong Kong. Uh, let me ask you about your time in 89. Um, you were a child reporter, yes? <laughs> Uh, yes, I was a reporter for the Hong Kong Daily News, uh, a Chinese newspaper, you may not know the name. <laughs> Actually, I was on the same, same plane as Mr. Yan, who grabbed away by the Public Security Bureau guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, you know, uh, Mr. Yan talked about, you know, he was encouraged by the people who were coming out to the street and fight for their own fate. And regrettably, they're going out to fight for their own fight, but the media by then was not or, or was not allowed to speak for the people.
basically, uh, the uh, Chinese reporter have a government line to follow, and that is why the people there was encouraged to see overseas media reporting on their fights of democracy. And you listen to the uh, to some of my uh, talked about overseas, telling you the uh, stories this uh, during the lunch and saying that how the Chinese people make their gratitude to the news report they made. And as a matter of fact, I have my own experience that's why I fight for press freedom in Hong Kong after the, um, um, the June 4 event. Um, I was, uh, I almost attacked by some soldiers when I, you know, touring around to see how the army moving. And I was, um, protect by an uh, old lady, actually, uh, a group of old ladies, not just one, because one holding my holding my hand and, you know, taking me away when some other old lady trying to stop the soldiers. And they, and, they, and they risk their life to do so. It's just to ask me to do one thing, is to tell the story to the world. Not just their, their own experience, but, the, but what they fight for. And it tells you how important press freedom is. And especially when you're seeing the, you know, the journalists during some march, they raise the banner saying journalists telling the truth. And it is very astonishing to a, a trained journalist like me in the West, uh, from Western cultures, because telling the truth is our nature, I mean, our job as a reporter. But in China, you have to fight for it. You have to, you know, really go to the street and fight for it. And that is why after that, I swear to myself, because at that time, actually, the um, return of Hong Kong to China has been fixed. It is our fate. So I tell myself that I have to defend the press freedom in Hong Kong so as our colleagues need not face the same face as the, re the journalists at that time. So after the Tiananmen Square, and I go to study, and then when I go back to Hong Kong again, I joined the uh, Hong Kong Journalists Association, which is the sole trade union of journalists, and serving the executive committee for over 20 years, and being the chairperson for nine years, and to fight for the press freedom. Although our effort doesn't make a, um, a very have a full mass, but I mean, with our fight, at least the deterioration of press freedom will not be that fast. And I hope more and more people uh, support us, then I think the fight can carry on much more easier. Mark, I've heard you say that 1989 is why you work as a journalist today. Is that is that accurate? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I've been a journalist since 1984, <laughs> and I was assigned to cover the uh, the June 4 events since uh, April mm. until the last day, and went back on uh, to China, to Hong Kong on 5th of June. So actually, I was determined to be the press freedom fighter, you can say. Beforehand, I was uh, a, a member of the Hong Kong Journalists Association, but I was a sleeping member. <laughs> Apart from paying bill, I, I won't do anything. I, I can tell you, I just you know doing my own work. But after after the Tiananmen Square uh, issue, I go back and join the uh, XCOM, which is a volunteer job, and fight for that since afterwards. I always telling jokes to my colleagues. I I have one payment for two jobs. The, my pay job, of course, pay me the, uh, the, my salary, and, I, and it allows me, or give, at least give me a, lot, a, a chance to work for the volunteer work of the journal, uh, Journalist Association, because it's, it's quite heavy, actually. I always talk, uh, teasing myself. I was the brain and also the cleaner of the whole association. <laughs> you have to think about, you know, how to fight, and you have to work it out. So, um, and that is the situation. Thank you. I, I want to say that the Hong Kong Journalists Association is very well known 
outside of Hong Kong, and it is it is the organization that everyone looks to as the front line as the front line journalists. Um, I, so we're here to talk about dates. Uh, for Hong Kong, there are very significant dates. There's 1984, the year of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which is an international treaty registered at the United Nations. It promises one country, two systems, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong with a high degree of autonomy. Um, uh, so Martin, Martin Lee uh, is a longtime democracy leader. And uh, this July 1 marks another anniversary. It is the 22nd anniversary of the handover from Hong Kong to China. Um, reflect back, Martin, first to 1989, when you helped lead two million people marches, two separate ones, in Hong Kong's narrow streets, and uh, and then bring us forward to today about how the joint declarations promises that were guaranteed by the international community, are they being upheld or not? Well, the two um, marches were fantastic. Um, I was then the vice chairman of the Hong Kong Alliance, Si Wa being the chairman. And uh, at the end of the march, we set up a platform, so we were all on the platform, and we were waving to the people who came finally to that stage, and then they would disperse and go home. And my hand was tired. <laughs> and then I used this hand, and I used this hand, and I said, I'm so tired, I want to go back to bed. But I want to see more people. So I had that feeling. Um, oh, no, that's <laughs> And um, I remember the 4th of June that morning. I didn't know what happened because I was sleeping. And in, the, in those days, we had a landline. So in my, my extension in my bedroom, I switched it off. Uh, and of course, Hong Kong Alliance people were ringing me throughout the morning. And I only woke up because it was not a calm day for me at, at 8 o'clock, answered the phone, and I couldn't believe it. And so they asked me, come to the Happy Valley, uh, the race course, because we had prepared to meet there anyway on that day. And then when I got there, um, Sito Wa, in fact, already gave orders to buy a coffin to lead the march. And I said, that's questionable. What would the people do? Because they were, they were so angry already when you, uh, when you lead the procession with a coffin. I don't know how we can control the people. So we, we had a long argument until Sikama said, OK, we put the coffin outside the offices of the uh, Xinhua. <laughs> and it says, it's even worse. <laughs> because the main door is made of glass. So people will, of course, break open the, the door. And then what happened? So after some more arguments, he was like, okay, cancel that order for the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I heard of anybody who ordered a coffin and then canceled <laughs> <laughs> And then later on, we heard that uh, uh, a lot of journalists were trapped in Beijing. And they wanted to come home, and uh, there was no way, because all the tickets expired. So I was asked to arrange for a plane to go there. And I don't have a plane. So I, I went to uh, one of the uh, sons-in-law of uh, Y.K. Pao, who was then the, uh, the CEO of Dragon Air, Helmut Stolman, um, an Austrian guy. In politics, we were on opposite sides. But that evening, I rang him up at 11 p.m. I said, Helmut, I need your help. What help do you want? I said, I want a plane. Why? Then I want to fly the journalists back to Hong Kong. It's all right. I can't do anything tonight. Bring me tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. I rang him. Said, when do you want it? I said, uh, I don't know. And 12 o'clock? I don't know. Two? I don't know. So said, anyway, give me two hours notice. Why do you need two hours notice? I said, as, as, as soon as I find out when they will be there, I want to play there. He said, I want the two hours to fly the ready plane there. <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, okay, how much would it cost? Because the, the government may not pay the bill. All right? He says, I won't charge anything other than actual disbursements. Right? We won't make a single cent of profit. Okay? How much? 
He said about 130,000 Hong Kong dollars. That's okay. I can, I can pay. So okay, so we have the plane. Went back to the legislative council because there was a debate going on. And I told the people that my fellow legislators, I got a plane. Then they started to argue. My dragon air. <laughs> <laughs> One guy said, why not British Airway? <laughs> Another person said, surely, cafe. <laughs> I, I then I left the room. <laughs> I went to the chief secretary, David Ford, but he was having a meeting. But his secretary said, Don't worry, Mr. Lee, we know what to do. Just go use that plane. Don't 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 wait for them. And if necessary, the government will pay. So the government paid. And then the plane took off. I got a phone call from Dragon Air. Mr. Lee, good news and bad news. <laughs> Good news is the plane is on its way. Bad news is without Li Chao Yan. That was the plane. <laughs> hey, we obviously have a, a full circle involving uh, uh, aviation here. Uh, I, I want to turn the conversation from aviation to extradition uh, because there is an immediate threat to Hong Kong's free society. Um, uh, Human Rights Watch has written to the Hong Kong chief executive. Uh, the Washington Post said it would be, if the extradition law is passed, it would be tantamount to importing China's legal system to Hong Kong. And what it means, uh, I think everyone in this room uh, who's followed the kidnappings and abductions in, in Hong Kong, five publishers, billi a billionaire from the Four Seasons, um, uh, and I think the big fear is, of course, that um, once you're in, on Chinese soil, you will be forced to give a televised confession and the rule of law will not apply. So, Martin, you've spent your entire life fighting for the rule of law. Can you tell this group, and especially knowing that these are people who live, work, and visit Hong Kong, what are the risks to Hong Kong's free society and what can they do about it? Tools. Two questions. Each demands a long answer. Make it short. <laughs> but the implication of this law is a very short bill to just amend it, the existing law. But the effect is that whereas today there is no arrangement between mainland China and Hong Kong for the rendition of fugitive injustice. Rendition meaning extradition within the same country. Okay. Now, certainly, our chief executive wants it, uh, which would mean that anybody in Hong Kong, including tourists, may face a risk of China wanting you back for an offense committed by you maybe 10 years ago or whatever. Okay. For example, if you have been doing business in China 10 years ago, so you went in, in, in Shanghai in a hotel. They would produce the evidence that you were actually spending the night in that Shanghai hotel, right? And you sold drugs on that night. And all they need is not even an, an affidavit, but only a witness statement to that effect. And that would be placed before the court, and you will be sent to China. And as Minky says, the moment you are there, they are very good at making you confess before the TV camera. And that's a problem. And then, in other words, Hong Kong cannot guarantee the safety of anybody in Hong Kong. Not just us, but any one of you. Particularly those of you who make speeches today. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would not be so stupid to say, ah, because of this political speech. No, 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 because it's not extradited. Right? They will concoct a case against you. And they are very imaginative. So they can concoct any case against you. So we cannot guarantee your safety. What was the second question? Uh, what can this room do about it? Well, uh, many of you are very influential. Now, this can be stopped. I'll give you an example. In the year 2003, Hong Kong faced a similar thing when the government was pushing for the enactment of a law, a law 
which would be dealing with treason, sedition, theft of state secrets, because of Article 23 of the Basic Law, which requires Hong Kong to legislate on its own in relation to these matters. So it is a duty. And I thought we should also legislate, except that that particular bill would have seriously eroded three of our basic freedoms of the press, of religion, and of assembly. That is why we should oppose it. And I didn't think we could possibly win because we did not have the numbers in the Legislative Council because our electoral laws are so flawed and unfair. And then, about two weeks before the passage of the bill, there was a press release from the White House saying that the US government was opposed <coughs> to this bill and calling on the Hong Kong government to establish democracy as soon as possible. And once I got that, I talked to the British uh, um, commissioner at the time, and he came up with a statement, very strong statement, to support us. And then the Australians, New Zealanders, and so on, Canadians, all came up to support. And that encouraged the Hong Kong people. So there was a huge demonstration on the 1st of July, 2003, the sixth anniversary, over well over half a billion people. And that caused the Hong Kong government to, first of all, postpone the passage of the bill and later withdrew it. <clears throat> so that is a very good example how international support could help Hong Kong people to ward off that particular piece of legislation. So the same thing can happen. Thank you to our Hong Kong guests. They have uh, just arrived in New York last night. I, I wanted to say um, uh, that preserving freedom in Hong Kong is um, obviously desirable for the Overseas Press Club. It is also possible, and we want to thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The record room is being in real time. It's great to agree to moderate the election. And last panel, we have three, three panels. Then, then it's time for break. Yeah, you're always on the, on the Facebook. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My fellow panelists. Sophie? 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 Christina Larson of AP was not able to be here with us today, so I inserted myself into this panel. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Blumenstein with the New York Times. I worked in China from 2005 to about 2009, and no TIFF from my uh, time in China. Um, uh, TIFF has been a longtime correspondent in China and is the author of The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, The Worker, The Factory, and the Future of the World. Uh, coming out next March. So, oh, okay. Uh, yes. So the forthcoming. Um, and Sophie Richardson is a, a China Director for Human Rights Watch. And Bill, who has done a yeoman's job organizing today, so thank you, Bill, is author of the new... Um, uh, art of War, China's Deep Strategy in the United States. And the reason I thought this panel was so interesting is that I think a few years ago, many of us felt that in the West, that China's restrictions on the internet would mean that China would be handicapped in terms of advancements in technology. But in recent years, we've seen enormous progress um, uh, in China making dramatic advances. In many ways, China is now beating Silicon Valley um, on many fronts, whether it's AI, you know, WeChat, social media, you can't even really use cash uh, in China now. It's a cashless society. 
Um, but yet they've also developed the most sophisticated digital surveillance system in the world, and it's one that's spreading. So I just wanted to kind of start out, and I definitely want this to be a discussion and open it up to your questions as well. But to all the panelists, and, and Tip, let's start with you. Did we miscalculate and, and underestimate China's sophistication in technology, thinking that censorship would equal, equal um, uh, you know, a sense that they would always be backwards? Uh, I think clearly we did. And uh, it was not just starting with censorship. I mean, when I arrived in Beijing in the mid-90s, um, the, the, the received wisdom amongst all the journalists that covered business, anyway, was that China's uh, terrible IPR, intellectual property rights record, its lack of innovation, controls over the companies uh, themselves, uh, was all just uh, a recipe for, for, uh, for not having a, a vibrant technology sector ever. So I would say yes, and then, and then certainly with censorship, uh, the same, the same uh, perceived wisdom was very, very common. Well, my, my primary contribution to this panel is, is my work, work on seeing what China's done with technology. It's developed inside China and exported outside of China. Uh, I, I, my book, The New Art of War, what the Chinese are doing inside the United States. So but first point would be Huawei and their development of 5G uh, uh, telecommunications, wireless communications. It essentially represents what the Soviets did with Sputnik, the first time it went up in the mid-50s, and we were all astonished that they could do that. Now it's the Chinese who have, uh, using their state-based uh, capitalism system, have created uh, a 5G, they build the, the equipment as well as the software, and they've leapfrogged the capabilities of the Americans. And so Nokia and uh, Ericsson are the only other two manufacturers of this equipment in the world. So suddenly the Americans are waking up to what's in effect a, a fait accompli, because the Chinese know from their own domestic controls that if you can, if you can control the telecommunications network, and you therefore have access to all the traffic on that network, and you can use it from time to time as, wanted, as warranted to tap into the lives of companies, individuals, uh, different groups. So this, this alone, the development of their telecommunications technology is as uh, surprise everyone in the United States, and, and that's why we see today the Trump administration fighting sort of a desperate last minute effort to prevent our allies from adopting the Huawei uh, telecommunication system. So that's just one example of what we see China manifesting outside of China with the technology that also developed inside China. Sophie, did, did we miscalculate, did we underestimate China on the tech front? Well, I, I, I think consistent with a lot of other fronts, I, I think we missed a lot of clues along the way about just what the depth and breadth of the state's intent was, right? I mean, you know, we all know that the impulse on the Chinese Communist Party's part towards social <laughs> control, you know, dates well back to, you know, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, think about the street committee system. But I think the deployment and the acceleration of technology to pursue that goal, you know, the speed with which we went from having to talk about things like, you know, kind of garden variety internet censorship to talking about things like facial recognition software, you know, that was a very short period of time. And yet, if you think backwards about it, the effort that would have gone into developing that technology, figuring out how to deploy it, and we've just put out a report, there are copies outside, about a, a police app that's being used in Xinjiang to surveil and detain people. And you know, my 13-year-old son will always roll his eyes and say to me about just about everything, Mom, there's an app for that, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was editing this report, he looked, he was he was sort of looking at it with me and he said, There's an app for that. <laughs> and, you know, I think that I think we have to start thinking that way about imagining some of the worst case scenarios about how technology is being deployed. We, we were having a very different discussion 10 years ago. I want to talk about Xinjiang, but before that, uh, Bill, you mentioned Huawei. And um, I have to say, I go back and forth on this. There's a lot of people who, who think, um, even, even people who are not supporters of President Trump, that he's absolutely right to, um, to go very hard on Huawei and to try to uh, uh, lobby the rest of the world um, uh, to the U.S. side because the internet is breaking into two. There are others who look at the arrest of 
of Ms. Meng and think there's there's no way that politics are not involved here. How, how should we regard, or how do you regard the Huawei case and um, the implications of what's happening now? Well, this is just one one technology. There, there are others, quantum computing, uh, many other compute technologies the Chinese are working on. This is the first time they have, have surprised us by being able to roll out globally a technology where we don't have an offering. So the Trump administration is trying to slow this down through the political pressure, through the arrest of Ms. Meng, through the publicity surrounding uh, Huawei's attack on uh, the uh, T-Mobile uh, lab in Washington, Washington State. Uh, but it's too late. Uh, I mean, basically, uh, countries around the world see this technology as, as, as attractive and as low-priced, and we don't have a really good technological offering to compete with it. So the, the, the heart of the problem is that China takes a long-term five and ten year development scheme for these transformational technologies, and we don't. So when, we, when they hit with something like this 5G capability, we're left without any really good response. Tiff, do you think it's all politics, or are there legitimate concerns here? Uh, well, I think, there's, I think it's politics, and I think there are legitimate concerns. And I don't think there's any... <laughs> reason why they wouldn't be mixed together um the you know there's an element yeah is there a back door are they monitoring us probably um of course the u.s knows how to do that and has done that with its own telecom companies as we know through snowden and others um but uh of, of course there's politics in it and i mean the the uh, they call it made in china 2025 which was they talk about it less now but it's sort of their clarion call to build a, a global technological power with world competitive companies that will um, not just uh, take market share from, from the, the American companies and European companies at home, but will do it around the world. Um, uh, it's, uh, that's also something that the Trump administration has spoken out against, and um, it's political. It's a, it's a, it's a rising power, uh, very powerful already now, China, and uh, some people might say declining power, uh, uh, butting up against each other. So I do think uh, politics is very much a part of it as well. Sophie, could you, you just mentioned your report on Xinjiang um, and uh, Huawei is an active uh, uh, player in the smart cities and the surveillance technologies. Um, could you maybe just outline what, uh, to start uh, the discussion about surveillance, what, what's happening in Xinjiang now? Sure, although if I can, if I can add just one thought about the, the, the Huawei debate. I, I, I guess I'm a little bit puzzled by this discussion, it, or maybe it's the, it's the politics that we're talking, to me, there, it's different politics that are interesting. And it's the reality that Chinese companies are obliged by law to hand data over to the Chinese government if it asks for it. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about inside or outside China. So, yeah, I mean, yes, we can talk about whether the Trump administration is pursuing this for reasons other than you know, the integrity of 5G networks and, you know, a profound respect for users' privacy. I say that with tremendous sarcasm. Um, but, but, you know, I was in Australia last summer and there was a, a full page ad in one of the newspapers that said, one in every two Australians already relies on Huawei. And I found myself thinking, does one in every two Australians realize that their data is at risk of being shipped off to China? Right? I mean, that's the conversation I don't see governments having quite honestly with lots of people that must take place. Anyway, on Xinjiang. Can I just say that um, if Huawei were sitting here, they would say, and not that it's my job to 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 talk for them, but 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 they would say that no one has ever been able to prove that that's happened and the UK and other governments have done extensive testing. And and if anything that we see from the Snowden documents, it's an American companies that we're surveilling. Well, I, look, I'm trying to say that Human Rights Watch does plenty of work on abuses right. by American and Western companies of data privacy violations. Uh, so we're, we're good on that front. But, but can I also just say, we didn't see this coming two years ago. So just because we hadn't found evidence of it doesn't mean that it isn't a problem, right? And I think Beijing is perfectly good at creating you know, the legal veneer to do lots of different things so that when the time comes that that, that lever needs to be pulled, they can say, you know, here's the law that makes this, you know, a, a, an, an appropriate step. Um, 
Very quickly on Xinjiang, um, you know, this is the, the northwestern region of China that has now a roughly 50% of the minority population, Turkic Muslims, um, that the Chinese government has long regarded with at best suspicion and at worst uh, a, a commitment to the idea that these people are politically disloyal. And since a new party secretary who had uh, presided over multiple different kinds of human rights violations in Tibet was moved over to Xinjiang, uh, in 2016, uh, the authorities there started a new strike hard campaign, and that's turned into mass arbitrary detention of, you know, we believe up to about a million uh, primarily Uyghurs, other ethnic Turkic Muslims, largely because they're Uyghurs. There's no legal basis for these detentions. There's no process for challenging the fact that you're being held. And we've documented people being held for weeks and months at a time and forced to spend their days studying uh, Xi Jinping thought and other Chinese Communist Party ideology, singing patriotic songs, and being forced to study Mandarin, and of course not being allowed to worship consistent with their faith. And people have no idea how long they're going to be there. I think it's also worth pointing out that the conditions for Uyghurs outside the camps in Xinjiang isn't a whole lot better. You know, pervasive restrictions on movement, religion, peaceful expression, you name it. And how much, in, and, 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 and Tiff and Bill, feel free to jump in, but how much of this is is fueled by the cameras, the monitoring, the, the tech the tech element of this? Uh, how big of a role is tech playing in the in the, uh, in the the treatment of the leaders at this point? Well, I think tech has clearly been deployed to an extraordinary extent in that region, largely to hoover up uh, information about people through all manner of technology, whether it's Wi-Fi sniffers, facial recognition, this app that police use. Uh, but I think what's most troubling and what breaking apart this app told us is that the, the basis for people's detention, the behavior that's now considered problematic, is largely legal. In effect, the authorities have decided that if you're using too much electricity, we're still not sure how much is too much, or if you're putting gas in somebody else's car, or if you are uh, socializing more frequently than you used to with your neighbors, that that's considered suspicious. And it at least warrants further investigation by the authorities, and in some cases, wow. detention. You know, all of this is enabled by multiple different streams of technology that are aggregated in one central system that then tells people police what what and who to go out and investigate. Chinese have surprised American experts with their rapid advances in telecommunications and also information technology. So it seems that the technologies they've developed to control their own populations, uh, the cameras, the algorithms, the AI, the, the massive use of computerized that data, that they're rolling out that model in Ecuador, the Times reported that model, the cameras uh, looking at the population of Ecuador, my colleagues, uh, 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 Sheridan Prasso for, for Bloomberg wrote about how they rolled out the system in Zambia. Uh, China is helping Venezuela and Maduro stay in power by uh, helping with the national credit card uh, ID system. So the surprise is Americans were, were flabbergasted by this APT10 case in the broken December. Their, their level of sophistication has reached the point that they were able to create malware that faked out IBM's cloud computing system, and they got access to IBM's cloud computing system, which would be one of the backbone systems of the American computing uh, system. And they were able to then get inside and study keystrokes of, of people using the system, and then to duplicate their logins and their passwords and log in as registered users. And they used that, that penetration. They were inside for four years. Four years. This was done by Group APT10 out of Tianjin, which is affiliated with the Ministry of State Security, according to the feds. So the Chinese level of sophistication has reached the point that they can penetrate our systems at will. It's striking, Sophie, what you mentioned that, that two years ago, just the speed at which this has occurred, that, that we just did not see it coming. I mean, Tiff, uh, you've been writing for a while about smart cities. Is is uh, is this kind of surveillance that we're seeing in Xinjiang, and, and I want to talk about elsewhere in a moment, but is this um, an extreme example of smart cities? Is this a smart city? Like, oh, you know, we're hearing, uh, you know, is this a super smart city? Uh, you know, is it, that sounds very benign. And, and so, so, so where does, where does the one begin and the other, and the other 
I, take it up. I think I think it is important to remember that this. You you talk to a, a company, a Chinese company that's doing smart cities, and I, I did an interview of not too long ago, a little over a year ago, with uh, a senior VP from iFlytech, and they're the the probably the top voice recognition company. Um, probably doing. I think we're, we Sophie would know more than me. Uh, we know that they worked on Uyghur uh, language. They're probably doing some very, very scary things in Xinjiang. And I talked to them about smart cities and the projects they had been working on. At that point, I think they had 20 different cities they were working on in China. Um, they uh, spent a lot of time talking about the challenges of rolling these out. And I took them at their word. I didn't have any reason not to. Uh, some of the specifics, uh, for each person, they were saying about 5,000, uh, 4,000 data points would be collected that in the, in the, their idea of a smart city. For a company, it would be 5,000, so even more. Um, they said that uh, a, a city might have 50 different, 50, 53 apartments, departments, I think they, it was the figure, um, all of which they would wanna, each of them to be feeding uh, their data that they gathered, whether it's public security, whether it's traffic, whether it's social welfare, um, um, all this, would, they'd have to get 50 different uh, departments to cooperate. They said it's a huge headache. So they, well, the first city they did was, was Uhu Anhui, which is where they're based. And so the mayor or the party secretary, basically, they were telling me, told, told the, uh, the departments, you cooperate and start sharing your, your information or you're not gonna have a job anymore. Uh, and so they spent a lot of time complaining about how difficult it is to roll these out. They said on the provincial level, this again, this is about a year and a half ago. Things have changed, I'm sure. They were like, forget about it. That's that's just a, a whole nother level of, of nightmare and logistics and twisting arms of, of officials. So they talked about um, uh, about that. Um, and of course, they presented it as uh, a great service to the residents of the smart city. Um, they uh, said, you know, what used to take six days to get your pension processed, we can, you can now do in a day because we've got everybody on board. Um, it was funny. There were two, two uh, iFly, iFly tech officials there, and the, the, the gentleman who was slightly junior started to talk about how they were using it for deciding who can have more children. And this was right, maybe just right before the, the, the policy was loosened on, on having a second child. And the, the, the senior VP was a woman, Dubai. It immediately interrupted him and said, don't talk about that. Let's talk about pensions. So so anyway, um, uh, but of course, yeah, this this is at home. Of course, they're exporting it. Um, Kenya, Tanzania. Do you think of a still a smart city system to Nairobi that they're also able to tap into that through the Huawei connection? Can they also, can they get, get access to the information that's stored in a smart city system? You mean, I, can would, the Chinese get access? I would to it? think so. As long as they're using Chinese technology, I'm, there's no. It seems like there would be no reason why they wouldn't have access. Um, and if they needed, if someone wanted that, who was powerful enough back at home, yeah, why not? Why not uh, send it home? So, so as Bill mentioned, the Times recently did a story about the use of um, uh, extensive surveillance system, uh, in Ecuador, a system called ECU 911, and and. Uh, financed by loaves in China, um, uh, thousands of cameras around the country. Uh, it's become a bit of a political controversy there, but the story says that uh, we reported that this has been deployed in 18 countries, um, ranging from the Middle East to Germany. Uh, I guess a question to all of you, um, are we seeing you know, the world basically divide up into uh, you know, countries that are adopting these kind of surveillance technologies, uh, you know, courtesy of China, in many ways financed by China, and those who, who are not, and how worried are you about their spread? Well, I'm not necessarily wildly well equipped to give you a survey of the globe. Uh, I can certainly tell you that, you know, we wrote about, oh, Minky, help. We wrote about ZTE selling voice recognition software to the Ethiopian government, I think in 2013 or 2014, you know, with the explicit goal of, you know, training officials on how to use it to surveil conversations between the political opposition. and. You know, I, I think it will be very interesting to see how these kinds of investments play out, you know, in jurisdictions that have very strong privacy rights and that have a free media and that have, you know, independent professional legal systems where these debates can play out. 
and ones where you know those institutions that can help defend privacy rights don't exist at all. But I also have to say, you know, what you were just saying about iFlyTech prompts me to make the following point, which is that a lot of big Chinese tech companies are also giving money to or establishing partnerships with universities uh, in the U.S., across Europe, and Australia. And iFlyTech has some sort of partnership with MIT's flagship computer science laboratory. And you know, I think some of those schools need to answer some questions about what the precise nature and parameters of those relationships are, and if you know, if, if they're at all uneasy about or even well informed about you know, some of the abuse of conduct some of those companies have been engaged in. If you're asking a question that is almost impossible to answer, but right now we're so linked to the Chinese in tele telecommunications and computing wise that they are stealing data from us. They can get into our systems. They stole 400 million names of travelers and their passports from Marriott Starwood. They stole 135 or 140 million names from Equifax, plus all, all their credit ratings. And they stole 20 million names from the Office of Personnel Management, uh, government officials. Uh, and they also been stealing health records. So the question among American data people is, what are they doing with all this data? Uh, they obviously have developed very sophisticated data mining and data uh, analysis techniques. Uh, the worst case scenario is that they could cross-reference these different databases and comp compile dossiers or files on key Americans that they want to know about. It's, li it's likely that they've completely penetrated the U.S. Navy. Uh, in the APT-10 case, they got 100,000 names of U.S. Naval personnel that they didn't already have from the attack on the Office of Personnel Management. So once again, the Chinese capability of managing data globally has really uh, exploded. Uh, Tiff, you, you've written about uh, uh, different uses of technology, including um, migrants in, in China, and the sense I, uh, um, how, the, how the migrant populations in, in some instances are being forced to return to their provinces. Is te does technology play a role in, in, um, in, in those areas as well? Are we seeing... Um, you know, it's it's helped China leapfrog in many instances, but are we are we seeing other places where it's being used uh, uh, politically? Um, yeah. So uh, actually, in the, in the book that I that I do have coming out, I look a lot at, at the migrant worker population, and, and indeed many of them are starting to be to head home as the factories automate. In some cases, they're being many cases being forced out of the larger cities. Um, technology. Uh, sort of an interesting thing to keep in mind about, uh, and, and this includes the social credit system and also some of the, some of the more uh, scary authoritarian technologies. Uh, the Chinese, I think it's, it's fair to say the Chinese government has used it, uh, borrowing a, a phrase from a, a professor of Chinese labor activism, uh, used it in both a repressive way and a responsive way. So the, the technology they're doing, for example, the social credit system um, they're actually increasingly trying to use it to deal with uh, issues of these perennial problems that migrant workers have faced with wage arrears, not being paid by their bosses. So there's been an effort to try to use the social credit system to uh, give demerits to factory bosses that don't pay workers. And, and they're actually, they've been doing this. They, they've slowed down recently because the economy's not doing so well. So that, now they're like, go ahead and don't pay them if you, if you don't have the money. But about a year and a half ago, this was a big push. If you look and they do it through the, they, they even do it through the public security ministry. So that if there would be a labor dispute and a protest, you have the police there and they would gather a lot of information on, on all the participants. So some of it uh, clearly intended uh, repressive, punitive for the worker activists. Uh, uh, worker activists have found themselves punished in the social credit system where they don't have access. First of all, they can't get a job afterwards. Um, then they maybe start try to start their own company. They also can't get loans. Um, they can't register a company. I talked to I talked to worker activists who tried to become small entrepreneurs, then found that they, that that was not possible. But again, on the other side, they're trying to punish. They were trying to punish the factory bosses uh, for not actually paying these workers. So it's a weird sort of uh, dual system there. Um, and you can see that. Um, um, is, you can, is the social credit system operating at the provincial level, but not yet at the central government level? Are, are they developing in different cities? 
different provinces and different tracks? What, what's, the, what's the exact status? I, I hear conflicting reports. So the you know initially the uh, uh, initially the uh, I think the state council in 2014 laid out a action plan for the social credit system and was very open about it. You know, reward the the the, the good and punish the bad and and, and change social behavior in the process. Um, uh, then they sort of gave a mandate to cities to just run with it. Um, there isn't a lot of clarity about how you're supposed, as a city official, how you're supposed to uh, uh, implement the social credit system um, uh, in, in, a, in a particular jurisdiction. Um, it is spreading. I, my understanding is it's still basically being managed at the municipal level. Um, they, they did say by 2020 that they would have a national system. They didn't say um, what a national, how they define a national system. Most people I've spoken to think next year they're going to say, okay, here it is, 2020. Here's our next five-year plan to continue to implement this. You think they stole the uh, algorithms from Equifax that have helped them do this, create this system? <laughs> that, no, I don't know. Yeah. Um, along those lines, um, I, I, I um, see you nodding your head about the social credit systems. Is are these? I mean, it, it is as Tiff says. Um, you know, on one hand, it could be helpful to people, um, and China is uh, in a position where it, it wants to be very ambitious and leapfrog its rivals, particularly in the tech world. Um, but but it also is is very much keeping keeping a score on people. How concerned are you about about this beyond even the you know the Xinjiang issue? Well, I think you know the, the theme has come up repeatedly and and rightly today about you know, the fact that people have you know ordinary individuals have very little ability to weigh into policies and politics and say what they do and don't want you know and draw any sort of parameters or lines you know around their lives and how the state engages them. Uh, I get very frustrated by, you know, articles that say things like, well, Chinese people don't care about their privacy. Well, you know, how, why would you logically expect people to value a right they've never had? That doesn't make any sense. You know, and so in that sense, yes, I think we are quite worried about this because even if you, know, you can see some ways in which the system could be beneficial, there's so much evidence to suggest that the state's uses of technology are really about control and that, that they have negative consequences and there's really no way to circumscribe that or, or push back against it or really opt out. And I think as long as those, those prevailing conditions hold, I, I think the relative improvements are, are you know, minimal and frankly chosen by the state, not by people. Sophie, do you think that we can see widespread erosion of civil liberties and human rights around the world as the Chinese roll up these systems in more and more countries? I think it depends enormously on you know which other governments you're talking about. <laughs> you know, whether they're you know whether they're democratic, whether there's a free press, whether you know you could imagine taking you know a company to court for having violated your privacy rights, whether you've got privacy rights at all, right? I mean there are, you know, I, I think the the, the potential variations on this story are enormous. I want to um, ask you all a few questions, a couple questions about AI and then open it up to all of you for questions. Um, Bill, there's a Kai Fu Lee has written a book about China being the world's uh, uh, new superpower on AI and uh, the, the, the sheer scale um, and advantage that China enjoys because of the data that you mentioned right. before. Um, this is um, something of great pride to the Chinese. Uh, the government, I think, has invested $600 billion. And meanwhile, the U.S. Is, has, the government has not invested much at all. Um, couldn't this be, in, in some respects, a very good thing for China um, and the economy? Uh, and well, as, well as, as well as uh, present obvious uh, it's drawbacks. A, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, kai Fu Lee's point was very interesting. He said, uh, the Americans may have a number of visionary, visionaries and different types of AI, and they may be the ones who come up with some of the most original ideas, but in China they have hundreds of thousands of engineers who are pretty good. And if you take 100,000 pretty good engineers and put them up against one of these AI problems, and you have massive data sets that you can work with, and you have infinite government funding, you can make further progress than the Americans can. You can get ahead of the Americans. And so 
and most of the experts I've talked to say the Chinese are on par with us in AI, if not ahead of us in certain respects, because they've used their population and the massive data sets that allow AI systems to be trained, the deep learning that occurs. So economically, the Chinese want to export these systems. Uh, uh, they're starting to do that. They're trying, they, they, so it's a big, it's a big money maker for China. But the downsides, of course, are the ones about civil liberties and human rights that these systems can be used to uh, manipulate a huge amount of data and extract lessons from from it about who are the good people and who are the bad people. Uh, Tip, what do you predict China will do with its AI uh, uh, prowess and ambitions? Uh, I think that I'm, I'm difficult to, to predict that. Um, I would imagine uh, we could see uh, beneficial and very, very scary applications, and we're, you know, we're seeing those in it, it appears to be in places like Xinjiang already. Um, I do think uh, I do think it's interesting, and I heard this again referring back to this interview I did with iFlyTech. I do think it's good to remember and maybe a lesson for for our our leaders in the U.S. how important government support is for these things. And uh, the I, particularly on AI, um, iFlyTech told me that the government uh, at both the central level, the provincial level, city level, everyone has different programs in order to, to encourage AI, whether it's funding the kids that go in the university that want to study it, whether it's um, tax waivers, if your company gets designated as uh, doing something interesting in AI, or, uh, or, or a myriad of other kinds of benefits. They told me it's extremely important. They, they're also facing the same competition everywhere in the world for tech talent, Baidu, with, you know, competing with iFlyTech. Um, and the, the iFlyTech told me there's basically, we have two sources for, for uh, competing for people. One is you know, obviously recent graduates, and the other is poaching them from other agencies. That's that's a horrendously uh, difficult competition, but it is key that the government continues to do what it's doing, the government at all levels, and support uh, the development of this AI. But certainly, I just say, I, I followed a lot of the automation in the Chinese factories, um, and the uh, role of the government at different levels in supporting that is tremendously important. They both fund the robot makers because they want to have um, an indigenous capability of making robots, and they've done very good and made a huge progress when uh, Medea, a big uh, company that was previously known for making air conditioners, um, bought KUKA, you know, one of the world's largest uh, robot companies, um, and the German, you know, sort of the crown jewels of Germany. Um, and we don't know how much money might have, might, it's unclear how much of that was uh, state loans and that. Um, but again, on the on the robot robotic side, you've got huge subsidies for factories that replace workers with robots. They have a program called Replace Workers with Robots. Thing. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then they and big huge subsidies if you are designated as a as a serious robotic maker. Back on AI, just quickly, uh, we in this country seem to have a view that it's dangerous and that there are ethical concerns and. The employees at Google didn't want to work on tools that might be used by the American military. In China, it's the exact opposite. They are gung-ho, enthusiastic. They are developing it as fast as they can and figuring out that we'll, if there are any ethical issues or moral issues, we'll figure that out later. But first, let's develop the tools. So they have very, they have, there seem to be a divergence of attitude about it. Uh, let me just add one one quick point, uh, which is to say that I think this is an area or, or some of these issues, particularly about you know the variations from one place to the next about legal systems or privacy rights, you know, means that there is an enormous need for international law on some of these issues, so that you know with a, with a view towards setting some of the highest standards with robust protections rather than either. You know, a race to the bottom, or you know, a decision to sort of postpone those issues until after technology has already been developed and deployed in some places, you know, to really horrific ends. I would say that that issue also came up uh, and was discussed a lot earlier this year with the gene sequencing uh, yeah. uh, incident in in China as well. So, so it includes that. I would love to open it up to questions. Um, I believe, or I can hand you. Oh, okay. Susan Jakes. Mm -hmm. 
I have a question that's not completely well formed yet, so it may come out get unformed. But when I think back on um, the years that I spent in China and the times when the Chinese government made large investments in different kinds of technology, maybe not in things that we would think of as high technology, but road building, water treatment plants, uh, things that were sort of government priorities that got lots of investment and got rolled out across the country. Often there would be this moment when the um, large scale um, expansion of capacity kind of came into this moment of friction with the way that things worked on the ground. So you build a road and then you realize that the, you hadn't built the, you know, plumbing that needed to go under the roof so the road got ripped up and then the road would need to get ripped up again to put in the electricity or the water treatment plant uh, turned out not to be able to actually connect to the water system of the city and so it would just sit there idle. And I had a talk with a friend of mine who recently moved back from Beijing who was talking about how a lot of um, luxury apartment buildings in Beijing have, in, have um, installed facial recognition software on their gates uh, so that only the people who live in the buildings can get in, but then because um, you know all e-commerce goods have to be delivered on um, little motorcycles, it's totally impractical to run the surveillance systems, and so the door, the gates are just jimmy to open, and people come and go as they did before. And so I just I just wonder about this. I mean, obviously these technologies, when they're implemented perfectly, have vastly scarier kinds of applications, but, and I wonder the same thing about the social credit system, which I, my understanding is it's kind of a patchwork and it's done differently in different places and they're not all very well connected. And I mean, presumably all of these kinds of technologies are subject to the same kinds of social factors, improvisation, bureaucracy, corruption, that so many other things in China are subject to. Yes, or or are they sort of floating above uh, the the sort of nature of Chinese society in some new way? And what's the implications? Oh, well, I think they're absolutely subject to all these things uh, to the to the to all those problems: corruption, um, uh, whatever it is, convenience. Uh, we can't get our packages delivered, so let's just leave the doors open. Um, and uh, the various huge you know, the various uh, priorities they've had in the past, whether it was clean energy and they continue to have, um, you see this cycle where they're sub everybody gets a subsidy, they gain the system, maybe they're not even making windmills, but they figure out how they can get registered at a local office that they're making windmills so they can get the money, um, or they're making really, really bad ones, they know, don't know a thing about it, uh, huge waste. Um, Often we get a glut that affects the world. Um, you know, prices collapse, companies go bankrupt, which happened again in um, wind, in windmills and, and other. It mainly it will send photovoltaic cell cell panels in China. Um, you sort of what emerged out of that is some very very competitive Chinese companies and and sort of it, some of the some of the biggest in the world. Um, we're seeing it with electric vehicles right now. There's real worries that they're going to have a glut. Nevertheless, um, and then there's also the same concerns like, are they putting the, the the charging stations in place, right? Maybe they're not. The city's got this big plan to have what percentage of its vehicles electric. They don't have to. They've got like three charging stations to serve, you know, have three million people or something. Um, so all those things come up. Um, but uh, so far, I think you can see where China, to to a degree, uh, backed up by very large state capital has been able to muddle through these things. And uh, there's all sorts of casual, casualties along the way, but often do end up with something that's pretty impressive. Um, I certainly, again, on, on the robotic side, there's a huge worries about a collapse. There were, uh, when, when I was looking at this a year and a half ago, they were saying there were close to a thousand robot makers in the country. So I spoke to a robot expert at Tsinghua University and he said, we don't have it. Robots. <laughs> he's like, we might have, you know, we might have 20 that call them, you know, call themselves, you know, are serious about it. We have, you know, eight that are ser that are real, and ultimately we're going to have three 
you know, or so, you know, he, so I mean, that's what he said to me. And uh, again, you know, many of them probably never made robots. Now, that's, that's, that's a classic move in China. Just get to convince, convince the, or pay, pay off the local officials that you're a robot maker and start taking advantage of that. Um, we have a panelist who needs to leave in 10 minutes, so let's get a couple more questions. Uh, one, two, three. Thank you. Um, just a quick, Sophie started saying that we might have missed clues in response to the est over underestimating. I think that the missing clues has gone to just ignoring what's plainly in front of our faces. And some that have to do with like Wang Chen, former propaganda chief in 2010, said the next battlefield is the cloud, and whoever controls the cloud will control the future. So he told us nine years ago, this is what, where we're taking our, our, our army. Um, and I also think that the, um, all of the policies, particularly from Wuhan every year, laying it all out very clearly, the, the, the five-year plans, and the law, the cybersecurity law, and all the implementing, re implementing regulations have laid out a very clear playbook. And including the technology specific requirements that haven't been, you know, we haven't paid enough attention to. Very specific technology requirements that are in the law, so the legal decision. So my, my question is, uh, could, I, could you drill down a bit and say something about the role of the tech companies, but splitting it up a bit between the role of the foreign companies and the role of the Chinese companies? Because I think they're state champions, but there's also competing tensions on them. And then to remember that it's the foreign companies who built the firewall. It's the foreign company, Cisco, Nortel, who provided the routers and the, the backbone and the you know all of that, the fiber optics. So so that was then the firewall. But then in 2008, it was foreign companies who provided the the um, the, the the cameras because they bid for the Olympics game. So now we're going to go up to 2020, you know, the next Olympics. What? additional aside from the export. So I think thinking about that um, would be, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more of, 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 of about that because it's Microsoft who's now doing AI partnerships, R&D with the Chinese. So it's not just foreign and Chinese, you know, Chinese companies. They want the market. They're not just coming in with competitive tech. They're going in and saying, let's do it together. Let, let's, let's do that logarithm together. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Well, if, if the first thought that comes to my mind is if the current trend lines continue in the decline in perceptions between the United States and China, if, if in fact the narrative begins to build that this is a new, a new form of, of Nazism that's building, it's a new evil empire that's building, American companies are going to be in a terribly awkward position. Intel sells more semiconductor chips in China than it does in the United States. GM sells more cars in China than it sells in the United States. NVIDIA is a very hot semiconductor company. It's selling um, lots of technology into these spatial recognition systems. So if, if, if uh, there's a rupture in, in perceptions, the pressures are going to start building on American companies to say, uh, people are going to start asking them, what are you doing in China? Are you helping build a totalitarian state? Or are you helping to build uh, uh, a rival to American interest? So American business could be faced with a very delicate period ahead. I don't think we're quite there yet, but it could be, if the current trend lines continue in terms of the decline and the quality of the relationship, uh, we could reach that point not too far away. Uh, question in the back and then the last question. Thank you. So I want to follow up on uh, the social credit system uh, and ask the panelists talk about the extra territorial effects of China's social credit system. So take um, the controversy uh, between uh, airlines uh, and China, for example, on the issue of Taiwan. So the foreign airlines were actually threatened with social credit sanctions if they decided to list Taiwan as a se separate jurisdiction independent of China? And what about other kind of uh, extra territorial effects uh, that you've seen in implementing China's social credit system? How about foreign NGOs? Are they going to be subject to uh, social credit point system in China? Uh, my second question is about the export uh, of China's uh, first of all, social credit system. I think that the governance mode 
And secondly, their high-tech intrusive surveillance technology, their export to other countries, uh, Ecuador, um, other countries, do you see any successful examples? How easy or how challenging is it for China to do this to uh, for other countries? I don't know anything about the social credit system. We haven't looked at the social credit system uh, outside as, as it pertains to external actors all that closely. I'm sure Human Rights Watch's score is pretty low. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I, do, I do agree with the point that Tiff made earlier that, and implicitly was part of Susie's question that. You know, a lot of these systems are not necessarily as joined up as some of the rhetoric or the coverage might suggest. But I think UJ's point is a good one that, you know, it, this doesn't just have consequences for people uh, inside China, but that it can, you know, there can be consequences for foreigners as well. But did you look at this more closely? And I would just also, just to jump in here, social media companies, you know, WeChat and, and the other, you know, uh, you know the, the Facebook. Facebook, well, Facebook, but the Chinese um, social media companies uh, in particular um, are now moving abroad um, throughout Asia, in particular, and and that will be very interesting to watch. Actually, can I give you a quick WeChat anecdote? Which is, we started looking at how it's used by, particularly by politicians in other countries, to communicate with largely with Chinese-speaking constituents. Uh, and we've had a case in Canada from earlier this year in which an MP had actually posted uh, some information both on her Facebook page and her WeChat account expressing support for or sympathy for um, pro-democracy movements in Hong Kong. And we realized that the post on her WeChat account had gotten taken down. And we called her and said, do you know that? And she said, no. <laughs> you know, so there was an example of, you know, an elected politician in a democratic country communicating freely with her constituents being censored by somebody presumably sitting inside China. And I think that's, you know, a, a bit of a statement about our world today. But to be fair, uh, you just mentioned Facebook. We need, you know, obviously what happened in Myanmar and elsewhere, we we also, uh, you know, uh, need to look very hard at Facebook and other and, and Americans. Social credit score, every time you get a credit card offer in the mail, it's because the data company is because the United States data companies have 1,500 to 2,000 items of data about you. So the idea that this is wholly new and wholly evil and wholly Chinese is just so overblown. I just We need to get an even playing field, some baseline around the realities in the United States and in China without the opinion. I just, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, we talked about the degree to which the people of China care about privacy or don't. Uh, Robin Lee, the head of Baidu, got in a bit of a bit of trouble a while back, public public uproar when he suggested that the Chinese didn't care about privacy. It came back on him hard. People were like, yeah, yeah, we do. China, you know, take these with a grain of salt. China is in the process of putting in place some, some, uh, uh, some privacy laws. Uh, and uh, we all know that the, we all know about the rule of law in China, but they're, they are putting in some Looking at putting in some laws that, at least on paper, would uh, put larger restrictions on companies sharing data, what kind of data they can share, than we have here in the United States. They're, they're talking about it. We'll see if the laws, uh, that doesn't mean the government can get access to the information. That doesn't mean that the companies will necessarily follow those regulations. We'll get excited about that when a million Uyghurs can ask for all the data that's been gathered on them to be deleted yep. and expect uh, that actually to happen. And one last question. These are very good questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, similar to uh, Simon Holmes' question, uh, I recently uh, finished a report on uh, titled uh, Censorship and Abetting Evil, uh, documenting the role of Western companies uh, in uh, Chinese government's repression of human rights and freedom. Um, so, uh, like the, uh, the many, many Western uh, companies, including the, the, the tech giants, uh, Yahoo, Google, uh, Microsoft, um, you know, Apple, and all these companies, there's uh, several features. So they uh, have been facilitating uh, the, uh, the Chinese censorship system, the surveillance system, the high technology to the mechanism. So my question is, um, um, are there some methods 
to stop these uh, Western companies from doing so. Why don't I throw it up to our panelists and you can answer the question along with any closing thoughts. And it's an interesting question. Um, some of the Western companies are not allowed in China, but certainly um, a lot of the enterprise companies are. So any any final thoughts? I don't see a good way to do it. I mean, an uh, easy way to do it. American companies obviously are interested in making money, quarterly returns, seeing their stock price rise, growing their sales. They, they have not yet incorporated into their thinking idea that they might be supporting a totalitarian state. I mean, I have not seen any evidence to suggest that they're open, even open to the idea of talking about limiting their sales in China. So it's, it's, that would be a steep hill to climb, in my view. I think if, if pressure were to come, I think it would have to come from activist investors or uh, media and social pressure in the United States. So we saw, for example, going back to a low-tech example, the rise of a college anti-sweatshop movement on American colleges. Previous to that, companies like Nike didn't worry about, or didn't worry very much at least, uh, about what was going on in their factories and how old the workers were and how many hours they were working. It became an issue. I know an enormous. I wrote about this with uh, um, a, a former colleague sitting over there. Uh, we wrote we wrote a lot about about how uh, the, the sort of the reaction, how the big brands, the big retailers, the big uh, companies had to respond to the fact that they're listed companies in the U.S. They were in trouble. You know, big, you have big uh, institutional investors that are starting to, CalPERS in California or something, starting to put, put pressure on them. I think that's probably the most, uh, not easy, but the, probably the best potential route to actually start to put pressure on these companies is back here at home. Thank you, Rebecca, for moderating. And thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Tiff. And thank you, all of you, for coming here today. Most productive conversation.